The Secret Library Podcast is brought to you in part by support from listeners like you via the Secret Library Podcast Patreon. You can learn more about supporting the show at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 118 of the Secret Library Podcast. My guest this week is Allie Robottom, and her debut book, Jello Girls, is out now from Little Brown and Company. Her essays can be found in Vanity Fair, Salon, The Florida Review, No Tokens, The South Loop Review, Hunger Mountain, The Rumpus, A Women's Thing, and Elsewhere. She has taught fiction and nonfiction at the University of Houston and Cal Arts, as well as at Boldface, an undergraduate creative writing conference. Allie's been the recipient of fellowships from Imprint and Tin House, where she was a 2016 scholar. She holds a PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Houston and an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts. She lives in LA with her husband, John, French Bulldogs, Butter and Jammy, and Ham the Morgan Horse. I really, really enjoyed this conversation with Ali because it touches on topics that we have referenced but never directly gone into before on the show, which is how to write about real life relationships in your life and the difference between writing about family members who have died versus those who are still living and how that writing experience impacts your grieving process, how that impacts your experience with the book and how it can change and transform your relationships with the people who are still here. Um, I can't say enough about the experience I had reading Jello Girls in terms of thinking about women in my life, women's stories in my family, and how it drew parallels and brought up kind of thoughts about what the impact of generations of experience can be. And I think that having a book that can not only provide context and history for your own family, but also begin conversations that the reader would have with themselves or with their own families in general is a really beautiful thing. So I so enjoyed talking to Allie this week and learning more about her experience writing Jello Girls, and I know you will enjoy listening in. So here we go with Allie Robottom. Hey, Allie. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. Good to be here. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about Jello Girls because the way, at least the way that you reference writing the book in the book, is a different process than I think anyone we've ever had on the show before has had which was that there's a combination of your memoir drawing from, as you put it, your mother's memoir that she was working (laughs) on, and then also sort of a historical research portion about Jell-O itself. So I'm really interested in what point you felt like, okay, I'm really going to go for this book because I know that it had to be very soon in the process of losing your mother, that this happened. And I'm interested in how you started the book and how you kind of made the book your own with all of the source material that you had. Yeah, um, great question. Uh, It was a real challenge. And I think at times, like because it is kind of an ambitious book, for better or for worse, and there's um, several different strands, narrative strands that I was really trying to include in a meaningful way um at times I felt like oh no I'm I'm definitely gonna have to lose some of this at some point like I I need to like cut loose any number of of threads and it really wasn't until so I was working on this as it's sort of a different book but in in some regards the same book before my mom died but um it was sort of after she died and when she died that I was like, okay, I'm going to go for it and I'm going to switch up the way that I organize this material. And that's what enabled me to include it all and to sort of manage, I think, like the restructuring process, which was really um, sort of like working on a puzzle was actually helpful in those initial days and months um, after losing my mom. How was it? I mean, this is a tough question, but I was very interested in whether it helped your grieving process or if it was um, how, I guess, what the relationship to your grief process was. Because losing your mom in 2015 and having a book come out in 2018, knowing the timeline of writing, editing, and selling a book is 
you know, you had to be right in there with the book at that time. So how, I mean, how was that for you? If I may be yeah. so bold. Uh, you may be. It's a really interesting question and nobody's asked me that yet. Um, what? How has yeah, nobody no, asked you yeah. that question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, to be honest, it's been really intense. I mean, um, more so than I think that I have been aware of until like very recently, um, like with like last week. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So I the book sold. I think it was in like January 2017. Is I think that's right. So it was like really. Um, my mom died in September of 2015. So it was like when she died, I think my first reaction was like, I'm going to write this book. Like I'm going to get this book finished. I'm going to get it out there. And for various reasons, I was able to just like focus on writing at that point. And it was, I became sort of a manic writer Mm. for the first time in my life, much in the way that my mom had been sort of a manic writer I'm sort of figuring this out as I answer this question because I've, like I said, I've never been asked it. Um, I became sort of a manic writer like she had been for the first time. And I think that that was like a big component of my grieving process, as well as sort of the drive to really sell the book, which honestly I hadn't had before, not because I didn't want it to sell, but because I didn't think that it was a possibility sort of. It's or I had like lower ambitions for it. And then losing her somehow made me be like, no, I'm going to like get this out there for the entire world to read somehow, some way. So, I mean, yeah, it's like the book has been a vessel for me to grieve through, I guess, in some ways. And now that it's out in the world for people to read, it's becoming like a whole other layer that's tacked on to the grieving process, which I think is most people know it it doesn't really go away it's just like changing um i'm about three years out now about to be three years out and um yeah it's better but it's not gone (laughs) no of course it's never gone i think yeah i think something that's something that's interesting to me because as i was reading the book thinking about okay having been through the loss of a parent in this story as you share and the loss of a parent who was sick for a long time in various forms, sort of in and out of illness, yeah. and having that part of your story, I could see the sort of the benefit of writing about it for yourself. But I wondered how it felt once the book is out and now people are reacting to it. I could see myself having a harder time with that than writing the book in that situation. Yeah, yeah I think you're right, honestly. Um and, you know, this process with this book is uh, really awesome. And, and I'm very, like, I feel like and this is probably a very gendered thing. Like, I feel the imperative to, like, assure everyone that I'm very grateful in this moment. And I am. Um, but it's really, really hard to, like I've said at times, I feel like I've sort of, like, lost her even more. Like, I don't, now that the book is out, it's almost like, I want to share her and and her story with the world, but then like people are reacting to it and having their own experiences with it. And it almost separates me more from my mother and her story and our story, which is at once good because it allows me to live my own life and not be stuck in the past and also sad uh, uh, in another way, you know? Of course. I think this is something that that people bring up a lot when talking to me about things they wonder about when writing, and that is the fear of writing about people they know or people they're very close to or people they have a strong relationship with. And I think that in this one, there is you have such different um, different pieces to consider because there's your mom, which is it, it. I felt the strength of your relationship with her and the desire to tell her story well for her, one that she very much wanted to tell herself. And there was also the side in which you're writing about your dad, a relationship which wasn't always easy, that feels much stronger now in what you said, you know, throughout the book, and particularly in the acknowledgments, which was really lovely. How was that different? I mean, writing about one parent that you've lost, but then writing about a parent who's still there, where it hasn't, it felt like the relationship hadn't been as 
I don't want to say easy because it, it doesn't sound like it was easy with your mom, but, but consistent maybe? Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So I, I did put that in the acknowledgements, but I think it's sort of like a testament to how up and down and inconsistent my relationship with my dad can be, which is that like, even after I wrote the acknowledgements, we've had like a, a total roller coaster ride in relationship to this book and how he sees himself um, portrayed in it. And it's been really, really hard. It's just interesting because my mom, like when she was alive, would read my writing. Like I was, you know, obviously a writer prior to her death. And even when I was like at CalArts, for example, I was working on a different project, but one that, um, sort of took place over a single summer of her illness and talked a lot about the complications of surgery and that kind of stuff. And she read it and it was hard for her to read because she's sort of this like monstrous body in that text. Um, but she was always very open and welcoming to like my perspective on anything really, but uh, on her. And she was like, willing to be a, a character in my work in that way and and understanding that that's not the case for others and painful at times and you know brings up a lot of doubts for the writer and it it all um it's a very it's a very complex experience and one that I probably naively didn't plan for enough so I've learned <laughs> I've learned that um but yeah I mean it it has not been easy with my dad for sure I can imagine. I mean, I think that you were very brave in the way you told I, what felt to me as a reader, a very complete story of your experience. And I think that's always scary. You know, I think that there's something always scary about talking about people who can respond to what you're saying. And you had the opportunity to have both parents respond to your work. But I wondered, yeah. you know, if it's different for your mom because she was also writing herself and if there was a bond because it was a goal you both had to write. Yeah. And also because she was an artist and it was like, I don't think that that being an artist or art making allows you to do to lambast people in your work at all. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I do think that um, she had an understanding of what it what it means to take life and make something out of it that represents your experience of that life um, as opposed to like going like fact by fact or like trying to be very literal about everything. So she was, she understood like she, and she understood also that like I needed to make my art separately from hers and that that would be a different piece of art than what she would have ended up making and that there was room for both of them and for any other interpretations as well, which I think is something that um, I have like a ton of compassion for people who are subjects in other people's work. And I also think that there's room for those people who are subjects to respond through art as well. Um, like what I'm trying to say is I think that there's room for multiple memoirs on the same topic and if like my dad or anyone else would like to write one like I'd be excited to read it knowing that it would be very different than mine yeah I think there is there's sort of a I don't know there seems to be an evolving dialogue about what people <laughs> expect from memoir and what memoir and creative nonfiction are sort of expected to provide I mean yeah. I'm thinking back to the kind of James Fry debacle of, uh, you know, telling a story, claiming it's a memoir, but having fabricated, which is sort of at one far end of the spectrum. Right. And then the other in which we're kind of expecting something to be a textbook in which every fact can be checked off with a little checklist and that most things hang in the middle of personal experience. And it's just interesting to me when people share personal experience, it feels like the, the genre itself implies that it's going to be the writer's experience. But there are people who still think that it's supposed to function like a, like a historical account. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm aware. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I think for my book, like, unfortunately, the subtitle of family history is tripping 
some people up because it's like, I wish that I could go back and have it be like one woman's account of a family history or like, you know, like it, right. it is like completely subjective to my experience and how, like, especially a book like this, which is like, I took the events of my grandmother, mother, and my own life and looked at them through a specific lens. And it's a, it's a lens specific to who I am, but it's a lens specific also to uh, my interest in feminism and women's voices. And so that is a really different lens than what like my dad would bring to it. Um, yeah, of course. And it, yeah, like I said, there's room for both, but I think the lens is so specific in this book that it does like make it easy for people to be like, that is not what I made of this story. <laughs> or like, I, this is not what I made of your mother's life or whatever. Not that that's, that's happening a lot, but just interesting. I think it's always interesting how people respond to things. And I was interested in how you interacted with your mother's original material and, because you make reference to it a lot, but it isn't sort of included at any length. So she worked on this, what sounds like binders and binders of material that she wrote over many years. And you, it's not that you just got access to it at the end. It sounds like she provided access to you sooner. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in what your relationship was to her material and then how you sort of, I don't know how else to put it, like how you metabolized it or how you digested it and then included her story in your own book. Yeah. Um, so when I started, I was working sort of like very closely with her um, material and also like talking to her at the time and like asking her for more information or questions and that kind of asking her questions, that kind of stuff. And it was a challenge because I needed the material to know what had happened in her life and how she had seen it and experienced it. Um, but I think I say this in the book and I don't quite remember, but her voice as a writer was at times really brilliant, but it was also hyper detailed and just very much her voice. Um, mm -hmm. And I found it filtering into mine in a way that was scary to me, I guess, because I especially then, especially before she died, was very much like, this is my work. Like, I'm a writer and I'm individuating from my mother and blah, blah, blah. But so, you know, that did happen in early drafts. But I did find also that once I had all of, you know, the personal life experience information from her that I wanted and needed, I went back eventually in the book and rewrote a lot of it in my own and seemed it in my own language. And I think I needed first to get it down, but then I needed to take space and then come back and reinterpret it through my voice. That makes sense. I mean, I think it would be impossible to avoid having that happen if you've read that much material and you've been that connected to her through the process as you were and not have that creep in. Yeah. And it's funny because, I mean, her voice as a writer was something that really annoyed me when I was younger. Um, like I say in the book, my mom started writing when I was a child and her work evolved over the course of my life. And she was always sort of failing, feeling like she'd failed. And then giving up and then coming back to it and trying again and trying a new lens, trying a new approach and joining writing groups and getting dismayed. And um, at some point when I was in high school, she wound up giving me pages to read and like asking me to line edit them, which was probably really inappropriate on some level. Not really because I wasn't prepared for the material, I guess, but just because it was a lot. It was a lot of work and responsibility. But anyways, um, it was kind of amazing at the time. My mom and I didn't have a close relationship, but I was so invested in her story and in helping her with it. So, you know, I think at, at that point in time, I was really, really annoyed by her verbosity and how she went on for pages and pages about like seemingly uninteresting events at like the Austin Riggs Center or something. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's something that I, I actually really admire about her work. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating. I mean, there is, at that age, if you're in high school, it's kind of hard to separate oneself as a teenager from oneself as a writer looking at something because who knows if it had been somebody other than your mother writing it, would it have been different? I don't know. Like your feeling about it. It's hard, I think. You can tell. I probably would have been an asshole regardless. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I think we all are at that age. Yeah, Um, it's a horrible age. But I think it is. I mean, it's interesting that you built this whole trajectory of yourself as an artist because she didn't start as a writer. She started as a visual artist. Mm -hmm. which is always fascinating to me because there are so many good books about the writing process written by writers, which makes sense to me because that's our, (laughs) that's our format, you know, that we're comfortable in. You don't see a lot of sculptors, you know, sculpting. This is how to sculpt. It's not as natural a transition. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to me that she went from visual art to writing, but yours was consistently writing. And I'm wondering how it feels to have finished this book and put it out in the world. Do you feel like there's a new story emerging that's yours and separate or do you feel like there's more to say on your relationship with her or where are you with your own work now that this book has been released yeah um i think i have a couple thoughts on this and i'm not quite sure honestly like i've been working on a second book um I actually started it like as soon as jello girl sold again like in sort of grief mania Be- because I wanted to have something to do while I was like going through the pre-pub process with Jell-O Girls and because I'd read it was a good idea (laughs) to have something else to do and I'm really glad I did that. Um, But my second book, she's she's in it, uh, but much less of a character. Um, She's in it more as as she pertains to my life and adolescence and um, which is only like a small really small component of the book but so she's there and uh I enjoy writing about her but I'm also aware that like I sort of got good at writing about her I have a had a lot of practice and maybe it's almost like a crutch at this point that I need to like step away from in order to to get better at actually writing about like me and my experience and not sort of having to filter everything through her and her illness. Um, so, I mean, that's that's a project in my work and my life, probably. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. This is always an interesting question to me. And I think it's something that, that writers and I, I think probably all creative people put themselves through at some point is like, if there is a subject that perpetually fascinates us and that we keep coming back to, that instead of seeing it as a strength or something that's an asset or something that we work on regularly and say, wow, I'm really interested in this kind of story or this relationship in particular or that, Mm -hmm. that we have a tendency to call these things crutches and to think that, oh, I'm supposed to move past this and I'm supposed to be able to write anything or I'm supposed to be able to write on any topic. I mean, I was talking to um, Donald Ryan recently who wrote From a Low and Quiet Sea who who called his structure, which I thought was totally brilliant, a crutch of making it a drum tick. And I was like, really? (laughs) And I'm always fascinated when people say that. And it usually feels to me, as it feels when I, probably when I talk about my own stuff, is that it feels like we're giving ourselves such a hard time for something that we've actually figured out that we're good at. I don't know if that rings true for you at all. I think so. Um, That's interesting on like sort of another but related topic is that like for my second book, I have struggled a lot with finding an appropriate structure for it, wanting to do something structurally really different than Jell-O Girls. But um, (laughs) the book, like by nature of its like topic sort of asks for a not the same but very similar narrative structure and I'm like I've been resisting it and now that I'm sort of like giving into it everything is fitting together in the way that I've been like trying to get it to fit together for a really long time which goes to say that like sometimes like the obvious structure or like topic or the thing that's giving us the most that feels like it has the most heat for us is 
truly the thing we should be writing about. And it's not repetitive or unimaginative. It's just what's stoking our fire at that time. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's it's just amazing to me how hard we are on ourselves for things that are working and yeah. and how <laughs> quick people are to kind of, I don't know, dump on things that they do because they feel too easy. And as somebody mm-hmm. who has studied creative writing as extensively as you have and being as aware of all of the nuances and all of the options and like the smorgasbord of structures that are available <laughs> out there, I can certainly see the temptation of being like, well... I should try any one of these. And why would I stick with this thing that feels so natural to me when that may be what makes it work? I don't know. Yeah. I definitely think like in terms of that very like specific topic, like structure and how narrative structure that like um, a lot of the times, and this might just say something about like what I take on as a writer, but like projects that have a, like a big, a big scope or a big like goal, like I, Jello Girls had, it was sort of an amb- ambitious book, I think I said that already, in that, like, I wanted to fit all of these different seemingly disconnected narrative threads in and make it feel to the reader like they connected and added up and meant something about feminism and womanhood on um, sort of like a large and collective scale. And to do that, like, as much as I wanted it to have this sort of like experimental dreamy structure, like, I actually had to rely on a more, for lack of a better word, conventional structure to give me the room and, and the backbone, I guess, to, to reach in the places that I really wanted to reach. And figuring that out was, it was a long process. But once I figured it out, it was that easy. It was like, oh, now I I see, like, I've turned the key, and this is what makes it work. And it all fell into place. And um, I think sometimes, this sort of goes to your point about ease that like, like when I talk about it, I'm like, did I even write that? Cause it feels so easy looking back, even though I know I spent years on it. I think it's sort of like, there is this process of working at it and working at it and working at it and working at it. And that's the part that takes a long time. But then when you're like, ah, when it clicks, that part doesn't take so long and it feels so unfair. Yeah, but, I know. And it's like, what was all that crap I did beforehand? And then everybody's like, oh, I really wish my next book wouldn't take so long. But I think maybe what people mean is they wish that, well, what about this? What about this? Uh, uh, kind of experimental trying things. And like, it, it makes me think of, um, this is a ridiculous reference, but in the Austin Powers movie, when he tries to turn that little golf cart around and he's like reversing, going back and forth, going back and forth, back and, forth, and then eventually it's like completely stuck in a perpendicular direction and doesn't know Mm -hmm. how to get out I feel like that's what happens in early stages and early drafts is like oh what if I try this a little bit of this a little bit of that a little bit of this but then eventually you're like oh I can just drive I can just go but we want to skip that uncomfortable claustrophobic part where it doesn't quite work but I don't know if that's possible yeah I think you're so right I think you're so right (laughs) (laughs) I don't know and I wonder if if it was possible to skip that part, would it be worth it? Would it feel worth it to have the book afterwards if the whole part was, you know, just effortless? I don't know if it would. No, I think definitely not. <laughs> I think like, I don't know. It's like a, a lot of things I feel this way about and it, it's kind of extreme, but like the thing, like it, nothing's really worth it unless it's painful and hard to get. Mm. I, I don't know if that's true. The way that, I, like, when I said that, I was like, God, that can't be true. But, like, <laughs> and then maybe this is, like, my own, um, I don't know, psychological problems coming up. But, like, it it oftentimes feels to me that um, the win is, you know, sweeter for having worked for it. And, like, I, this comes up in my second book a lot, but, like, I can take that to a really extreme place. But, um like nothing feels so good as that first shower after you've been camping for a week. Like nothing yeah. feels so good as the book deal after you've been writing for 10 years. You know, it, it's, um, of course, we want to skip ahead to the book deal. But like you said, I, it just wouldn't be as rewarding if it were easy. No, I don't think it would. And I, But I also think it's like there's this weird balance where... While that is true, I also think sometimes 
we complicate things more than we need to in order to like kind of set up for that kind of satisfaction, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I'm going to make this really hard, so it's going to be great. Like, I'm going to pick a structure that's crazy, or I'm going <laughs> to do this in a way that feels really nuts, and then when I achieve it, it'll be that much more satisfying. So I think, mm-hmm. it, again, it's like the the spectrum between making everything up in a and, and billing it as you know, a memoir kind of back to the James Fry point mm-hmm. versus this is a completely, this is an encyclopedia entry, you know, finding the middle point that way. I think making it hard enough that it's satisfying, but effortless enough that it doesn't kill us in the process is probably the ultimate goal. Yeah. It feels like the way you said that, and just in regards to memoir, like it's a very specific problem to nonfiction because you're trying to make a piece of art and something that's readable and um, consumable, I guess. Uh, But at the same time, you have this constraint, which is like this person's true life events or um, this historical, this history and, and like making, making that a readable um, piece of art versus like an encyclopedia while still staying true to your source material is, the challenge for sure. Yeah, I think it comes back to the, and this is, this could be like 10 episodes, but the, the idea of like, what is truth in, yeah. in either fiction or nonfiction, you know, what are you, what are we responsible towards as writers mm-hmm. in terms of truth? Yeah. And I don't know if there's an answer to that. I think it's, I think there's a, as many answers as there are writers. Yeah, I think so. And I think, yeah, I mean, people are going to answer that really differently depending on, um, You know, whether or not a story, like the version of the story that's told is a version that they feel good about or a version that they feel not good about. Yeah. What surprised you most about writing this book? Was there anything that surprised you as you wrote it? Hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of things. I think the thing I said about the structure was probably the most surprising. Um, Just that, like, you know, when I was... um, Doing my MFA and my PhD, I was really invested in, like, for lack of a better word, experimental women writers. And I I guess I just thought that I would produce something in their tradition. And so when I discovered that, like, I just couldn't pack everything into this book without... Um, taking on sort of a a structure that I would have previously thought of as a little bit too simple, that was a shock. That was a big shock. But it was a good shock because it allowed me to say everything that I wanted to say. And I just don't think that I could have done that any other way. That's, yeah, I think that's so interesting too, because it's, there is the, the individual project that you work on. And then there is what that project how that project defines you as a writer and those can be different things. I was really worried about how this book um, would define me as a writer, I guess. Um, I didn't, I was worried about like how it would be marketed and and all that kind of stuff. And now I'm just kind of like zenned out and along for the ride as much as I can be. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, how has that, has that changed? Was it different than you expected or in terms of how they marketed it and how it came out, or did it go pretty much how you thought it would? I think it went, uh, I didn't spend too much time like thinking how it would go because I just didn't know, I guess. Right. I was like afraid that it would be very like sensationalistic and sort of like Jello Aris tells all. And like <laughs> that is uh, not at all how I see the book. And, you know, there's been a little of that, but that's, the media. Um, for the most part, I've been glad that it's been received and considered as like a serious book and not, I don't know, what whatever, like a, a, a tell-all, yeah, yeah, a tabloid exactly. type thing. Yeah, I yeah. can see people latching onto the word curse that, you know, your, oh, yeah. your mother's feelings about there being a curse against either, you know, some people believed it was against the men in the family, some against the women. And um, I could see that being a hook. For that kind yes. of attention. Yeah, it was definitely, I mean, it has definitely been um, something that the like, press has latched onto a lot, um, 
which is fine. I mean, it's kind of like, to me, it's like the curse is like a metaphor. Um, <laughs> the curse is like, right. like she was told about it as a child, but it it's not like a, a little, because people are like, do you believe in the curse? Are you afraid for your life? And I'm like, I mean, I believe in the curse as defined in the book ultimately as like patriarchy. Um, oh, yeah, genetics. I believe in that. <laughs> genetics is there too. Yeah, or genetics. But like other than that, like, no, I don't believe anyone like waved a wand and, and cast a spell and cursed the family. Yeah, I didn't get the feeling that you thought a mummy was going to come through your back door or something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, waving a jello mold at you. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it is, I, I mean, I think all families have that kind of energy. I mean, I think there is something that, you know, things that happened in history that impact family members that they carry with them, particularly the generation of your mother's generation and her mother's generation even more so. I mean, I think about things in my own family as well. It's like things that were impacted just the way history worked at that time and what women were permitted to do and what they weren't permitted to do. Yeah. Um, I think of those things a lot as sort of the curse of society and societal rules and all of the norms that you discuss in the book as being so restrictive for women. And in many ways they still are, although they've changed. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. That, that sounds in keeping with my idea of what, what the curse is. And, but like also, you know, something that I wanted the book to speak to, which was that you're right, like every family has their history and their attendant curses. So I didn't really set out to be like, this family history is is that unique, really. I, it was more like everything that I included in the book I wanted to use to touch on a more collective experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in some ways... One of the things I loved most about the book was how much, despite the fact that my experience is different in many ways, I could relate to kind of the energy of these things that had been carried and messages that had been carried through a family and how that impacts your life and what you think you can do or can't or what you feel obligated to do as a result. Yeah, that's one thing I've really actually learned. I mean, ironically, since I wrote so much about it, but like, more so through the publication process of this book, or like I've just thought about a lot, like the ways in which my mom's life was affected by her family <laughs> and her, you know, her relationships, good and bad, and the ways in which she was held back despite like really, really struggling for freedom and agency and um, a career and, you know, all the things, like, despite all that, like, I see more now, more than ever, what it was that was holding on to her and keeping her back. I'm sure. I mean, as you said, you know, after her death, you're kind of moving into the mode that she was in of this yeah. manic writer, I could see the empathy of taking on some of that experience yourself. Yeah. The self-confident stuff that I saw her um, struggle with her whole life, like, ebbed and flowed for me in the writing process of Jello Girls. And, I like, I really think it was, like, a huge component of grief, weirdly. Like, some people I've talked to have been like, yeah, after my parent died, I was just like, fuck it. And, like, I'm just going to live my life the way I want to. And I struggled more, I think, with that to like capture that attitude for myself, it was very different for me. Um, and I'm, it might have been because I was writing so manically because, and because like I think part of the writing process for a lot of people is an up and down like pendulum swing of self-confidence and then self-doubt. Yeah, I mean, I think there is something so vulnerable about writing a book that shares as much as your life as this book does. And that I can, I think you'd be kind of made out of Teflon if you didn't have some vulnerability in sharing, <laughs> you know, things about a parent's illness really in depth, your own struggles that you've had, you know, all of those pieces and, and very, you know, intimate details of the family history and, and how that came together and your parents' relationship. I mean, all of that, I, I think it would be pretty hard not to have a vulnerability around sharing that. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Well, I'm thrilled that we got to talk about the book. I hope 
people enjoy reading it. I know they will. I know I did. And I think that part of what I hope for the book is that it gets people thinking about their own family history and, and what that means for them, because it definitely gave me some insight and made me think more about my family and in particular, the women in my family and, and what life was like for them as a result of society. And I think that was one of the real gifts of, of reading it. So I want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. That truly warms my heart. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm excited to hear about your next book and hope that continues to come along well. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you so much for coming on, Allie. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.